Hello everyone. In today's video, I'm going to talk to you all about Amazon Redshift and why it's such a fantastic analytical and BI tool that you should probably be using in your organization. Uh, so in this video, I'm going to talk to you about what Redshift is, why it's such an excellent tool, how it stacks up to some other alternatives, and finally, a little bit of a discussion on its cost and some pain points. So firstly, let's get into what is Redshift. So Redshift is considered what's called a data warehouse. And a data warehouse is meant to bring together data sets from all across your organization into one single place so that it can be easily queried. Now Redshift natively supports distributed workloads and it actually incorporates a pretty neat feature called parameter groups so that if you have many different users that are all using this Redshift cluster, say for instance your analytics team, your BI team, and maybe your developers, you can configure your cluster so that certain groups have higher priority when performing queries or have more access to query slots as compared to other groups of your population. Third, it supports petabytes of data, and this is largely controlled by adding additional nodes. With the newer Redshift RA3 series hardware, you actually get automatic elastic scaling of your data. And fourth, it's optimized for some very, very large queries that can take place over multiple different tables, performing multiple different joins and groupings. Uh, what Redshift will actually do is that if you have some regularly performing queries, it'll optimize your database for those particular queries so that it can respond quicker to them next time. And fifth, how does Redshift compare to RDS? This is a pretty popular question. I would say that Redshift is more suitable for those of you looking to do uh, analytics, BI, data mining style queries, whereas RDS is better suited for smaller queries that take place at a more frequent basis. So that's what Redshift is. Now let's move on to why you should probably be using it. Uh, for one, it offers elastic scaling, so you can add or remove nodes to your cluster at any point in time. Uh, keep in mind that if you're just adding nodes, you're going to be using the on-demand pricing, which is a little bit more expensive than the reserve pricing, which I'll get into in a little bit here. Now, Redshift is considered a managed service, so there's almost zero maintenance. Uh, not saying that there is completely zero because you're still going to have to set up some alarms on things like sizing and CPU performance and things like that. But it is very much so what I would consider a hands off service and AWS does most of the work for you. Third, you get that optimized query performance that I was speaking to previously. Uh, so very consistent and reliable performance for some frequently running queries. Uh, fourth, you can support thousands of users within a single cluster by scaling up your cluster and adding more uh, nodes on top of it. Uh, fifth, it's got a very flexible pricing model. So like I was alluding to before, uh, if you use the on-demand, it's more expensive than the reserved instances which you need to purchase for a one year commitment. And there's also a third option called the Redshift Spectrum that I'll get into a little bit more later. And finally, it integrates super well with other AWS services. This is probably my favorite part of Redshift. Uh, so you can set up some very interesting combinations of ETLing your data into your cluster. For instance, you can have applications that feed data into a Kinesis data stream and chunks that data up into large five or 10 meg files, delivers those to S3 and S3 will copy that data into Redshift. You can also incorporate it with AWS QuickSight, which allows you to do some pretty neat dashboarding of your data as well. So definitely a really cool feature is the integration with other services. And next, let's talk about how it compares to some other technologies. Uh, so with RDS, I already kind of explained it, but let's just touch on it again. RDS is better suited for smaller, more frequent queries of relational nature. Uh, not much more to say other than that. Um, Athena, how does it stack up to Athena? Now, Athena is pretty similar to Redshift in the sense that you're performing and analyzing some very, very large, complicated queries with many joins. Uh, however, Athena has very inconsistent performance. You don't get allocated resources when you're working with Athena. So that means that if you submit a query and it happens to be very large, it can sometimes take hours, several hours I've seen in some examples for that query to even start running. Uh, so with Athena, you don't get provisioned or allocated resources. It's basically first come, first serve. But with Redshift, you do get those allocated resources that you have to pay for. However, you do get more reliable and consistent performance. Now, compared to EMR, also known as Elastic MapReduce, also very similar um, to how Redshift works, but not so similar in the use case you're solving with each of these two technologies. I would say EMR is better suited if you have a particular analysis that you're trying to run on a very specific data set that happens to be extremely large, a very repetitive task perhaps, that's what I would say EMR is more suited for. But if you're doing just general all-purpose data mining, 
uh, data analytics, business intelligence style queries, then Redshift is gonna be the choice for you. And finally, moving on to the cost and pain points. Uh, so in terms of cost, like I said, you get that instance based and you have the on-demand versus the reserved. Uh, with the reserved pricing, although the price can be a little bit steep committing to a one-year purchase plan, uh, you do save something like I've seen in some cases 50 or 60% over using the on-demand. So definitely consider it if you're gonna be uh, using Redshift as a long-term commitment because you do save quite a bit of money. Uh, and secondly, Redshift Spectrum is an interesting choice for those of you that don't wanna import your data onto your Redshift cluster itself, but you want your data to just sit in S3 and utilize your Redshift cluster to just analyze that data. Uh, so that's what Redshift Spectrum is used for. So you can use your nodes, not for data storage, but strictly for data analysis. All the other rules for Redshift still apply in terms of uh, parameter groups and workload balancing and scaling up and down. All of that still stays the same. The only difference is that your data is in S3 as opposed to in your cluster directly. And in terms of pain points, uh, what I have seen personally is that large clusters can get very, very expensive. In fact, some of even the small clusters can get expensive. So today, if you go on the AWS console and you use the recommended setup, which is an RA34XL node, uh, that's going to cost you $5,000 per month. Uh, if you use these smaller, seemingly going out of date uh, types, which are the DC2 large nodes, that'll cost you up to $250 a month. A very, very different size, but you're going to get some very different performance between the two. But just keep in mind, that's the price point that you're looking at just as a minimum. So it can be a little bit prohibitive for some of you, uh, especially if you don't have a very large budget. So just be careful about that. And finally, I've personally found that the advanced setup uh, to really get the most out of your cluster can be a little bit daunting. Behind the scenes, Redshift by default is partitioning your data onto different nodes, and these nodes all have different responsibilities and roles. And when a query comes in, that work is distributed to all these different machines and then aggregated back up before it finally gets returned to you. Uh, however, if you really wanna get the most out of your cluster, you need to do some more advanced setup, which involves query plans and optimization for caching. Uh, so there's a lot more that you can do here if you really get into the advanced setup. Uh, but if you really want to push your cluster to the limit, then that's what you're going to need to do. There may be some learning curve uh, for that. So just be prepared to spend a few hours reading the documentation. And if you like this video, I'll put a suggestion here on the right for you to watch next. And as always, please don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss out on my next video. Thanks so much, folks, and I'll see you next time.